everybody. Welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. Today, I'm talking to Dr. Henry Abramson. He is the Dean of the Lander College of Arts and Sciences, um, which is part of Toro University. Toro University is in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, it's a private Jewish university. So it's basically the uh, Jewish Brigham Young University in the New York area. And uh, he has a PhD in history, but specifically in Jewish uh, Ukrainian history. <clears throat> At least that's his first PhD. I'm not going to go through all the credentials, but in the description below, I will put his Wikipedia page so you can learn more about him. And he also has his own website. He also has a YouTube channel, which I watch pretty frequently, especially when I'm at the gym. I'm watching his videos and anything that you want to know about Jewish history. He it seems like he pretty much covers it. So I would highly recommend his YouTube channel. So thank you, Dr. Abramson, for graciously accepting the invitation to talk. Um, we're very excited to hear from you. So <clears throat> uh, in our communications before, I was wondering, you know, in my own previous experience prior to this YouTube channel, just my life experience, I had always thought that Judaism was broken up into reform, conservative, and orthodox. But then um, as I got to learn more, and specifically when I came across an article that was a Pew Research study uh, of Jews in Israel, they broke them up into four groups, Haloni, Masorti, Dati, and Haredi. And then, of course, there's other, I know that it's not it maybe doesn't break down exactly because like there's different shades even within those groups, uh, including like I'm I'm not exactly sure what Hasidic is, but I know it's related to the Haredim. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was just wondering if you could explain what that is. You know, a, a lot of my audience a lot know about Judaism, but there's others that are kind of on the same level as me. We're kind of Judaism 101. Uh, so I was wondering if you could explain what that is. Or sure. different, yeah. Uh, Davies, I, I'd be honored to, and uh, thank you for inviting me to your channel. Um, let me just make a couple of small corrections uh, about uh, Turo University before we go on. Okay. Uh, we are, um, we call ourselves a university under Jewish auspices, uh, but we um, have a large population of non Jews who also study in our many campuses. We're not just here in Brooklyn, what that's where I personally am based and my campuses are based, but we have campuses in Nevada, California. Um, we have campuses in Europe, in Berlin, in oh, Moscow, wow. for example, we've been, uh, and of course in Jerusalem. And uh, so we actually have quite a number of students who uh, come to us for primarily medical degrees. We have five medical schools, including one that's opening in Montana and so on. So it's like a big international school. Wow. Okay. Uh, um, Secondly, thanks for referring to the Wikipedia page. Um, it's not necessarily the most accurate. Maybe you've <laughs> okay. heard Wikipedia, but but it has a, a nice picture there, I think. Okay, so to go to your question specifically, um, you know, there's a, I think these, Judaism is a very difficult thing to comprehend um, in terms of uh, how we've uh, approached modernity. And when I say modernity, I'm talking about after the French Revolution of 1789. A lot of things changed for Jews and made things much more complicated. To start from the beginning, and I'm just going to give you the, this is going to be like a $5 answer, but I'll try and make it really simple. That's all that we're looking for. <laughs> you know, uh, Judaism is essentially sort of like a tribal institution that makes exceptions for converts coming in. Uh, historically, for most of our history, um, Jews have regarded identity in the Jewish people as being something that is conferred through the mother. If your mother is Jewish, it doesn't matter what you do. You can become Pope in Rome. You can become the Dalai Lama. You'll still be Jewish. There are a lot of great jokes about that, which uh, maybe if you like, I can tell you some of them. But it, it's like a tribal thing, matrilineal. Um, there are some interesting discussions about what it was like in the ancient period, because if you look before the giving of the Torah under Moses, there are some passages in the Bible that seem to portray it as patrilineal through the father. But certainly for the massive number of millennia of Jewish history since the ancient period, it's been recognized as matrilineal. Um, Jews can or non-Jews can enter the Jewish people through a process of conversion which historically consists of three things. 
for men, circumcision. For both men and women, immersion in a mikvah, you know, ritual bath. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, and most complicated, the acceptance of the commandments, which traditionally Jews regard as numbering 613, somewhat larger than 10 commandments. And is uh, that what, sorry to interrupt you, is that what halakha is? Is that the embodiment of those commandments? Again, it depends on who you ask, um, but the word halakha means the way or the path. And yes, you're absolutely correct. The way in which those 613 commandments are expressed in daily requirements, which are quite comprehensive. I mean, there is halakha that dictates everything from how you tie your shoelaces to how you do business, how you get married, how you eat your food, even how you sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it is a it's not like separated out into ritual law and criminal law and civil law. It's like the entire lifestyle is is dictated by halakha, yeah. the way. But let me get to the complicated part. Um, so um, for the most part, uh, Jews have always had arguments about how to define halakha, uh, certainly about specific points in halakha. But for the most part, for much of Jewish history, uh, the Jews mainly retained that sort of tribal definition of who is a Jew, of those who are born of a Jewish mother and those who convert in through those three steps. A big thing changed with the French Revolution when all of a sudden the definition of Jews uh, was left up to the individual Jew rather than the community. It's as if uh, you can imagine that, let's say, the rabbis decide who is a Jew, and all of a sudden from 1789, the rabbi's opinion is no longer relevant. And that meant that Jews, with the advent of modernity, could define themselves any way they wanted. And that's when we get the many terms that you listed a few minutes ago, Haredi, Chiloni, and so on. Um, they Were the rabbis... Why weren't they trying to still enforce that? Was it just like a popular, um, it just kind of happened naturally? Is that what it was? And the, the rabbis mm -hmm. couldn't do anything about no, it? No, the rabbis were definitely very upset about it. They were not happy with this change. But it came about with the emancipation under the, uh, the French revolutionaries, which was also imposed in America. Like, let's say, for example, here in America, um, you know, the, the, the American government will never tell individual Jews that you have to behave the way your rabbi tells you to behave, right? That's the American government's just not interested in doing those things, separation of church and state. Mm -hmm. So when the French did that, where most Jews were living in Europe, of course, not in America at the time, all of a sudden this meant that all kinds of Jews could say, wait a minute, I don't agree with my local rabbi. I'm going to become a different kind of Jew. And they could create alternative visions of halakha for themselves or even no halakha and that would be and is still remaining a jew maybe the, to clarify this before the french revolution the only way for a jew to not identify as a jew was to become a christian or in muslim lands to become a, a muslim there was no such thing as a secular identity where you could choose the degree of affiliation that you preferred now, we're up to about $3.50 of the $5 answer. So <laughs> okay. let me tell you what, what ended up happening. So with the, with the emancipation under the French, which, as you correctly opine, the rabbis were not terribly thrilled with, um, that meant that Jews could define their own sense of what it meant to be Jewish. Those who hewed to the ultra-traditionalist path were ultimately called, the term wasn't used then, but is used later, charedim, which is a, a Hebrew word that comes from the book of Isaiah. It means those who tremble. Yeah. And the full verse is those who tremble at the word of God. So charedim are generally those Jews who want to accept halakha in the fullest sense of the term as it was defined by the medieval um, commentators on halakha. Uh, then on the other side of the spectrum, way on the other end, Jews who reject that sense of how we're bound by halakha, those are the so-called chilonim. And this term is also Hebrew. It's modern secular Israeli. It's actually kind of a funny term because uh, it means literally the desecrators. 
And oh. yeah, and they take that. Did it not also mean uh, like empty or, or something to that effect? Yeah, it's related to, to the word hull, which is literally sand or even like meaning like uh, without any substance. But they oh, yeah. term it in the sense like, yeah, we don't we don't believe in all that stuff. We are openly desecrators. And it's kind of like a tongue in cheek term. Um, but it's been adopted as a, a more of a neutral usage. So Chilonim are very proud to be Jews, maintain their ethnic identity, mm -hmm. uh, but um, do not feel constrained in any way by halakha. Um, and that term is more used in modern Israel than it is in America. Um, but you could say maybe secular Jews would be on that side, where they okay. very proud to be Jewish. That's a very strong indicator. Whenever you measure Jewish attitudes, they're very proud of their ethnicity, but not necessarily they don't feel bound to keep the laws of keeping kosher and, you know, the laws of the Sabbath and things like that. And, and, then and, they, got, and sorry, I don't want to get too complicated, but they would be they would be separate from like reconstructionist or reform Jews like it's like a separate group again where it kind of mixes in there yeah it's a spectrum yeah and, and okay. jews again because it's tribal in nature jews are free to sort of wander along the spectrum however they want uh, a a jew who is completely chiloni who's completely a desecrator so to speak could walk into any synagogue at any time and and claim you know uh, uh a privilege to read from the torah there's uh there's nothing changing that because again this idea of if someone's mother is Jewish, they are fully invested in Judaism and, and no one can take that away from them, no matter what they do with their lives. Mm -hmm. um, so then if you imagine those as two ends of the spectrum, the Haredim on one side, they're very ultra-religious. Sometimes they're called ultra-Orthodox in uh, English press. And on the other side, you have the Chilonim, the so-called desecrators who are really just secular Jews. Then you've got a whole range of uh, spots where Jews say, well, this much halacha, but not more, uh, or only this much halacha. So, for example, um, uh, Orthodox, or maybe I could put it in a different way, uh, it's also a range of how much do Jews engage with the outside world. Yeah, The Haredim on the, the ultra-Orthodox side try to minimize their contact with the outside world in general, dress very differently, um, often speak a distinct language like Yiddish, um, don't send their kids to public schools, don't uh, have televisions at home, things like that. Very isolated from the outside world as much as possible. And, even, and even among like, because I was watching something about them. It was a really interesting video on YouTube. I'll mm -hmm. see if I can find that and put it in the, in the description for anyone that wants to watch it. But also, do they are they kind of uh, insulated within among Jews themselves? Because I... Sure. Definitely, okay. uh, because uh, association with more secular Jews imposes also the association with everything that secular Jews are involved with. I mean, if you have a Haredi Jew sitting down for lunch with a secular Jew, what are they going to talk about? The secular Jew says, hey, did you catch the ball game on TV? And the Haredi Jew says, what's a ball game? What's TV? Right. Like the idea is they're, they're, they're really trying to carve out their own life very separate. Yeah. But then as you move along this spectrum, you'll have, for example, Orthodox Jews, not ultra-Orthodox, who uh, may believe in kind of like a, a carefully modulated engagement with the world. Um, Orthodox Jews will likely speak the vernacular of the country as a native language, will be au courant with whatever's happening politically or socially in the country they live in, and will be much more engaged but at the same time, we'll strictly adhere to halakha. And you move a little bit further and you'll find conservative Jews who generally agree with the more extreme reform that halakha should change to adapt to modern circumstances, but not necessarily that quickly. So, um, you know, for example, one of the big issues would be um, use of automobiles on the Sabbath. The Haredim, definitely not. The Orthodox also no. Um, the Reforms say, yeah, no, it's it's not relevant. It, cars can be used in the Sabbath. And the conservative movement eventually agreed in the 1950s that driving is all right on the Sabbath as long as you're going to synagogue and back. Uh, but ultimately, that ends up becoming much more widespread permission. 
but it all is about their degree of how much do they involve modernity in their lives. I'm beginning to think I'm I'm getting to the six dollars of my five dollar initial uh, investment. I hope I haven't made this too complicated. As many dollars as you have. <laughs> okay. Well, no, I've got lots more dollars. We could easily <laughs> spend the whole hour talking about this, but uh, that's basically it. the various names that are used to describe Jews generally refer to how much they want to engage in modernity uh, with the Haredim or ultra-Orthodox wanting to minimize that engagement, um, the reform and the secular on the other end wanting to maximize that engagement. Would the terms Dati, would that line up with Orthodox in Masorti would line up with, is that the same thing as conservative? Oh, very good. Yes. But those terms are generally only used in Israel. Yeah. The yeah. Because you should realize that in in classical Hebrew, there is no such word as religion. Religion is synonymous with life. Like It's like, implied. Yeah. It's like everybody, this is the way you're supposed to live. So where they had to borrow words or readapt words for the modern era. So in Israel, they use the word dati, um, which means literally lawful. Um, that's that's what they mean when they say orthodox. And masorati, uh, which is a term that's used by the conservative movement in Israel, uh, it literally means conservative, like in a, to, to try and adhere to the tradition. Okay. Now, as everyone knows, in Judaism, there's no central really governing body that I, that at least that I know of. I, I think that in Israel, there's, there's a chief rabbinate. Mm -hmm. um, so how is it that conservative Judaism, for example, how does it stay homogenous? Like how, what kind of like dictates the standards? Do they, do they associate with each other and kind of consult with each other? Um, how do they stay distinct? And, and how is it that they don't like kind of like just blend into like whatever? Wow, Mr. Davis, we should put you in charge because uh, you are correctly anticipating many of the problems that uh, the, the Jews have with their own self-identification and, and organization in the modern era. Uh, prior, you know, with the destruction of the temple going back 2,000 years ago, um, actually the anniversary was just a couple of days ago, you know, the Jews lost any semblance of a central authority figure to determine what, what, what is binding upon all Jews. And the last 2,000 years have been Jews struggling to find replacements for that. The, the Haredim um, have the greatest advantage in that because they tend to be highly committed, uh, highly um, organized individuals following individual rabbis, but they're fragmented, you know, because, you know, the, the Hasidic groups, for example, which emerge out of 18th century Ukraine and Poland in particular, they have particular dynasties of rabbis that they are adhering to, but separate from each other, sometimes in conflict with each other. The conservative movement with a much wider engagement with outside society does not necessarily have the same kind of, uh, you know, I think the word is centripetal, where they all revolve around a single body and, and it and, um, you know, are, are loyal to that single body. They do have institutions. They do have like uh, a rabbinical board and things like that. But um, it, it is difficult for them not to sort of, uh, you know, fade away at the outsides of their community. Getting communal acceptance of their decrees is not necessarily so easy to do. And the reform movement, which is uh, still more engaged with society, really uh, actually embraces the idea of autonomy of individuals. And um, that is sometimes counterproductive when you're trying to get everyone walking in the same direction. But these are the challenges that many Jewish groups face in the 21st century. Yeah, so I guess we'll just kind of have to see how things go. Um, I'm sure, you know, and then within Judaism, of course, when Mashiach comes, Obviously, he would set everything straight. Um, that's the hope. That's the hope. Yeah. Uh, now, when it comes to the temple, because we have the Temple Institute that's prepared everything for the temple. Mm -hmm. um, how I don't know how much you know of the history of that, uh, the particulars, but how was it that they got that going and had and were recognized by the rest of Judaism, probably especially the Haredim, mm -hmm. to do what they're doing? Um, I'm, I'm not as uh, familiar with the specifics of 
you know, rabbinic approval of that particular institution. It is a very well-known institution, of course, but basically, you know, let me phrase it in perhaps with a um, uh, passage from the Talmud, which uh, says that, um, you know, after 120 years, which is a euphemism for after a person dies, 120 being the number that we all hope to live to, mm -hmm. um, God is going to ask us all several key questions about our life. Uh, one of them is, you know, did you do business honestly and things like that? And one of those questions is, see, peace of Yeshua, did you anticipate the redemption? Meaning, did you actively hope for the Messiah? Uh, and um, the way in which Jews have interpreted, well, how are we supposed to actually do that? How are we supposed to actually anticipate the arrival of Mashiach? Uh, many Jews over the centuries, it goes back a long before the Temple Institute, have said, well, we've got to anticipate it by actively studying the laws of how to construct the temple, how to create the various vessels that go in the temple, how to perform the ritual sacrifices of animals and, and of uh, the bringing of the offerings in the temple, even though we no longer have that function in Jerusalem, we got to be ready. And so... Uh, you know, there's been long for centuries, there have been groups of Jews who dedicate themselves specifically to those tasks. Uh, the Temple Institute is one of those, um, you know, uh, organizations that that fall within that category of really being dedicated to the, uh, you know, anticipated arrival of the Messiah at any moment. They want to be able to hit the ground running with here, we've constructed something that looks exactly like what we think the pans used to look like. And here's something that looks exactly like the trumpets they used uh, and because we want to be ready to go. So yeah. it, it's really an old tradition. And there's so many things happening that, you know, when when you when you watch what's happening in Israel and I, I follow a, a Israel 365 and they do really amazing coverage of things that wouldn't show up in regular news because they, it has a religious twist and there's just so many things going on and it's exciting when it comes to the reform movement. Uh, do they see any importance to the temple or are, are they anticipating Mashiach? Uh, can you speak to that? Well, it's, it's not really, uh, um, I, I wouldn't want to claim to speak for any other group or movement. And I, I represent no movement or anything like that. I'm just a regular guy, not even a rabbi, by the way. I know I look like a rabbi, but just a regular guy. Um, so you, the, uh, but I will say that historically there have been a lot of debates. Debate is is intrinsic to the Jewish tradition about what exactly will it look like when the Messiah comes. And there have been some, you know, surrounding, for example, Maimonides, uh, some pretty intense debates that, you know, who says that the third temple is going to look like the temples that were described earlier, that we definitely have a slightly different architectural layout as described in the book of Ezekiel. But like, for example, Maimonides suggests in some of his works that maybe the whole ritual sacrifice thing is not going to be reproduced the way it was in the ancient world. Uh, that's got him, by the way, in a lot of trouble. And uh, some Jews actually had his books burned, which was, you know, a tremendous, to use the Hebrew word shanda, the uh, tremendous shame um, or, or controversy, because this is what we're talking about. Maimonides, one of the greatest scholars of yeah. Judaism, but he definitely said some, some things that were controversial and quite provocative. He argued in, in his Guide for the Perplexed that, you know, maybe the whole sacrificial thing, you know, sacrificing animals made a lot of sense to Jews at that time in that place, whereas it would be alienating for Jews in our own times. So those kinds of debates continue to rage. And I think you would, if you asked a typical Reformed Jew, they would probably agree with Maimonides more reformist position with regards to sacrifices. Yeah. Okay. But ideally, this is one of the questions that God's supposed to ask us, right? Did you did you work for the Messiah? Did you try to bring about the redemption? Did you do your part? To bring it about, what what I've read because a lot of times I go to kabad.org because they explain things incredibly for anyone that doesn't know Judaism because I know it's like a outreach to non-observant Jews to become observant. So it's perfect for, you know, my purposes also, and others like me. Also an outreach to non-Jews as well, because they, they have a very strong Noahide sort of presence 
Yes. Um, well, dang, what was I? I forgot what I was just oh, about to ask. A, sorry to interrupt you. You were talking about uh, working for the Messiah. Oh, yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah. I, I, I think it was on there that I saw that. How do you work for Messiah? Because what I saw on there is it seems like doing good deeds, doing good acts, like one more good deed could bring him about. Is that is that and of course like performing mitzvot i'm i'm assuming is that what you do to bring about messiah as well as like what the the temple institute has done potentially by preparing everything for the temple yeah i i again not a rabbi so not yeah. speaking with the uh divine authority in any respect but the i do have some familiarity with jewish texts and um there are generally the idea that there's like a certain mass of positive energy that has to be released into the universe in order to bring about this redemption. Sometimes the Talmud will say specific things, like, for example, um, uh, the Talmud says that whenever you quote the name of whoever authored a particular teaching, that hastens the redemption. Hmm. So if I were talking to my friend the other day and I say, oh, you know, Mr. Davies uh, of Christian Homestead, he, he said this. Right. So just quoting you in in my repeating it to someone else brings redemption about. OK, that's great. Now, I did mean to ask as well. Um, well, two things. Uh, let's start with one. Um, what is Hasidic? It it belongs to the Haredim group or is it something separate? Correct. Uh, the, the term Haredi. And again, these are modern terms used in the 20th century, largely and onward. Uh, the Haredim, to remind your listeners, the term means those who tremble, and it's basically synonymous with the term ultra-Orthodox in the Anglo press. Um, so these are basically Jews who believe that halacha as defined by the medieval authorities, like the Code of Jewish Law, the Shulchan Aruch, is absolutely binding on Jews today, uh, as opposed to uh, more modern uh, movements like conservative reform who say, well, you know, we can modify here, modify there for whatever reason. So Haredim includes um, many groups. The perhaps the most prominent are the Hasidim. Uh, the this is a the term Hasidim means the pious ones, and uh, they're basically Jews who were inspired by a particular teacher in the 18th century named the Baal Shem Tov. Uh, he lived in Ukraine and southern Poland, and um, you know, he he taught a, a particular sort of spin on Judaism that emphasized communal uh, gatherings and the value of joy and, um, you know, really appealed to the population at that time and, and has continued to this day. Many, many different um, sort of uh, streams of Hasidic thought continue. Uh, the Satmar music, the movement, the Chabad movement, the Breslov, these are all as aspects of the Hasidic movement. They, they were in many ways a rebellion against uh, the, again, it's not really two different Judaisms. It's just kind of like a style or interpretation of Judaism. They would all agree, for example, that you still have to keep kosher. You still have to observe the Sabbath and so on. But they may disagree on, well, exactly how do you do it? Like one give you one example. Uh, the, the, the Torah says that it is forbidden to shave one's temples. Right. Like if I were to take a razor and shave my temples here for whatever reason, the, the Torah says that's forbidden. So it doesn't say, however, you can't get a haircut, can't use scissors, which are not like a razor and just trim your hair. So that's why my hair is short. I'm not Hasidic, although I am Hasidic friendly. But the Hasidim would say, you know what, if we can't shave our temples, we're not even going to cut the hair that grows there. And so they will grow long their forelocks. That's called peyote, and you'll see them dangling down. That's kind of like a a, um, a badge of pride for Hasidim about who they are and what they stand for. It's not like a new halacha or anything like that. It's just a way of expressing that halacha. Yeah. So the group that they rebelled against are called the mitnagdim. Um, that's a term that means uh, opponents because they oppose the Hasidic group. And um, today, the mitnagdim are either called mitnagdim or they're called yeshivish uh, because they tend to 
emphasize their identity around particular yeshivot or rabbinical seminaries, um, but they're also Haredim. They, they may have no peyot, but they are also Haredim. So the whole range of groups, uh, you know, also, you know, Middle Eastern versions of this, the Mizrahi and so on, but they're all in that same kind of Haredi category. It's amazing. It's amazing to learn about. When I watch your videos, there's a lot of times that I have to like watch several times because I, it, I'm trying to absorb all the information because uh, for some anyone outside of Judaism, it, it's kind of complex. <laughs> there's yeah, like a lot to it. Sure, it's really complex. Yeah, like, but it's two Jews, three opinions. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that many different times. Um, with the remaining time that we have, <clears throat> uh, just really quickly, if you can, uh, I also wanted to know. Okay, so after the second temple was destroyed and you had <clears throat> the diaspora, why why were the two main areas? you know, the Iberian Peninsula with the Sephardic Jews and then the Ashkenazi mostly in like Eastern Europe. But why were those like the two regions? So um, that's a great question, complica complicated. And a lot of Jews are interested in that question as well. Um, it had to do with the development of distinctive cultural orbits um, that, you know, arrive whenever you have populations that are separated over a significant amount of territory. Um, the Sephardim, I, I think one example of why things, you know, changed in such a way and, and sort of altered the, uh, the, the ethnic self-identification, uh, Sephardim in living in Spain, uh, especially during the, the first few centuries of their life there, uh, actually had a very unusual kind of trilateral environment where they lived with Muslims and Christians. And especially during the first few centuries of Muslim rule, there was really a tremendous amount of uh, what's sometimes called la convivencia, the, the coexistence. It's somewhat overstated, but Jews were free to pursue all kinds of professions um, and to uh, engage with society in a very uh, profound way. And then it was brought to a shattering halt with the Reconquista and the Inquisition, which left its own kind of mark on Sephardic Jews. Um, in Eastern Europe, and also really in Germany, East Central Europe, the Ashkenazim, they had a very different kind of cultural environment uh, that was scarred largely by the Crusades and tended to encourage Jews to uh, become more insular, look inward, and to regard the outside world as more toxic, more dangerous than the Sephardim had. Now, ultimately, the Sephardim were expelled from Spain in 1492, the Great Spanish Expulsion, and they found their way, you know, throughout the Mediterranean Basin and also coming to the Americas, but they carried with them a certain degree of, uh, of a different cultural outlook, um, and whereas the Ashkenazim, uh, who migrated first further east into Russia and to Ukraine and Poland, and then later many of them to America and before they were devastated by the Holocaust, um, they had retained that distinct European uh, outlook on um, on the outside world. Uh, and that's why, that, but... oh, sorry, not to, sorry, don't mean to interrupt, but that's know. why the Orthodox Jews, that's where they basically get the tradition of wearing the, the dark suits, the black hats, because it kind of comes from, that side right it's it's or is, is that right it's kind of like it's kind of flavoring you know it's a uh, uh it's a cultural orientation if, if you look the the actual the the uh types of clothing vary widely throughout the centuries um the talmud also has this which is predates both sephardim and ashkenazim the talmud was completed by let's say the year 500 um the Talmud also discusses the kind of clothing in halacha that a respectable person should wear, um, both men and women. And dark clothes just tend to be considered a little bit more dignified and quasi-rabbinic. But yeah. there's no real requirement, absolutely, that you wear a particular color of clothing or whatever, or a hat or whatnot. Just okay. those are, you know, cultural accretions. Yeah. By the way, if you don't interrupt me, I can just keep speaking and speaking for a long time. So it's probably better if you interrupt. <laughs> so <clears throat> when you did have like the two main groups, you know, they were separated geographically. Was there like at all very much communication between the two? 
Oh yeah, absolutely. Lots of communication between the two. Uh, and in fact, it, it probably was difficult to really parse out differences in a concrete way until the widespread application of printing. Because once you started committing a lot of these teachings to widely distributed books in which it says something, hey, this is how we do it, and someone else from another part of the world says, wait a second, that's not the way we do it, uh, that's when you begin to see really differences. And I think one of the most um, fascinating ways that this is expressed is that uh, you know the, the central code of Jewish law is called the Shulchan Aruch, the prepared table which uh, was authored by a Sephardi Jew. And uh, after it came out, it was a big success. And an Ashkenazi Jew reading it said, wait a second, we don't do things exactly the same way. So he wrote another book called the Mapa or the Table Cloth, which goes on top of the prepared table. And uh, that, just one second, please. Hey, I'm in an interview. You really really should knock before you come in. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> so we're gonna have to. That's okay. And, uh, I'll, I'll edit that part out. <laughs> you can leave it to it. Doesn't really matter. Let me go back to where I was. Uh, so uh, an Ashkenazi Jew wrote a book called the Mapa, the tablecloth that goes over the prepared table, that presents the Ashkenazi point of view. And ever since that second book came out, they have always been printed together on the same page. So Jews study together. If you want to look up any halakha, how do I tie my shoes? How do I eat chicken? How do I get married? How do I do business? Whatever it is, you will always see the Shulchan Aruch, the Sephardi opinion, and then the exceptions and the discussions of the Ashkenazim under the mapa, the uh, the, the tablecloth, as it were. That's when you begin to see really the distinctions and people can say, oh, I'm a Sephardi Jew. I follow this opinion or I'm an Ashkenazi. I follow that opinion. And so on. Yeah, because this has uh, somewhat survived to today. Everyone knows where they descended from. So um, what was that? More or less. More or less. Um, So but but there's. But it's not like a wide divide, right? Would you have uh, Orthodox Jews and you have some that are are Sephardic in origin and some that are Ashkenazi? And does that. Aside from what you just said, like some would prefer the Sephardic interpretation. Uh, is there much of a divide aside from that? Well, I'll give you a couple of examples. <clears throat> First of all, we should remember we're not talking apples and apples here because Sephardic and Ashkenazic are ethnic terms, meaning like my ethnicity, for example, is Ashkenazic. My family is all from Lithuania. So, uh, you know, that's you can see that. In, in my lighter skin color than many Sephardic Jews, uh, but also in you know certain behaviors and things like that. Um, and, and Sephardic means descended from the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal in particular. So they might tend to look a little darker skin, they might have darker eyes and so on, that kind of thing. Um, those are ethnic terms. Um, Sephardic, uh, or excuse me, um, orthodox and non-orthodox those are religious terms how does a jew identify and so there's going to be a lot of different overlaps strictly speaking um according to halakha and the way it's been dominantly interpreted is that you're supposed to follow your family heritage so if you are of sephardic descent uh, you can study the ashkenazic opinions but you really should follow the sephardic opinion and vice versa for ashkenazic it is a little bit, um, you know, flexible, uh, uh, especially if you have uh, Sephardi marries an Ashkenazi, you know, what are their children supposed to do? Uh, if it's a Sephardi father or an Ashkenazi father, does that make a difference and so on? I'll give you one example of, of the uh, type of difference. On Passover, all Jews are forbidden to eat leaven products. You can't have bread, can't have beer, spaghetti, things like that. So what about rice, right? It's not a leavened product. It doesn't, it's not a grain like the five types of grain that uh, make up bread, Uh, but, but it can behave a little bit like bread, right? You can make rice cakes, for example. Mm -hmm. So the Sephardim say rice, no problem. That's not bread. It's not a grain. The Ashkenazim have a stricter opinion say, no, are you kidding? No way. You can't have rice, right? So uh, if you are an Ashkenazic Jew, your Passover meals are going to be different than a Sephardic 
Jewish meals. Everybody's kosher, everybody's observing Passover, but a slightly different interpretation over how to deal with these um, minor categories like rice. Yeah. It's funny you say that because um, <clears throat> I served my mission in Spain. I was there for two years and uh, I was in the eastern part of the country. And so I ate a lot of paella. And so I could maybe <laughs> see why the Sephardim would argue for rice. <laughs> but um, and also my my mom is actually from Portugal. Um, and I would like to see that probably not because maybe the, it would have like carried down through the generations. But I'd like to see if at all, if there's any chance that I might be Jewish. But I think it'd take a lot of work. And who knows, maybe, maybe they were at some point and then they, um, you know, because a lot, as everyone knows, many, uh, if you didn't flee, then you had to convert. Mm -hmm. uh, some I know maybe retain that identity still, but others maybe just through time it got lost. Yeah. So. No, there are reasonable estimates that suggest as many as 20% of the Portuguese population may be descended from Jews. Yeah. It's a big number, one out of five. Yeah, that is a big number. Okay, well, I think we'll end it right here. So again, Dr. Abramson, thank you so much for taking some time out and talking with My me. Pleasure. Uh, this is just amazing. I really enjoy your channel. Uh, to you. everybody else listening, please, I would, if you're interested like I am, and I know many of you are, in Judaism, the history of Judaism. He has a magnificent channel. Again, I'll put the link for it in the description below. Um, if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe to my channel. Um, like the video if you liked it. Leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Please be respectful and not nice. <laughs> Um, most people, most of us are, but there's always some idiot out there. And then, does it um, work when you ask people to be nice? I, I find it does work so well on my channel. Actually, I think it kind of does. Uh, <laughs> you know, if they're a Latter Day Saint, then I think that they they take a second. And they're like, okay, yeah, but I, I don't know. Uh, and then also uh, make sure to share it with anyone that might find this interesting. And I'll talk to you guys later. <laughs>